This Talking Flutes podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes, making life sound beautiful. You can show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook, and at trevorjamesflutes.com. Hello everybody and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. Today I am joined by the wonderful Frederic Sanchez Munoz, a beautiful, beautiful Spanish flute player based in, if I'm getting it right, you're based in Switzerland. Am I correct, Frederic? Yes, you are correct. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here speaking with you. Yes, I'm based in Basel in Switzerland, but if I have to be technically correct, I am um, based in Saint Louis, which is a very beautiful village in Alsace. So I am in the border. I live in France, actually, but I work in Switzerland. Wonderful. Now we're trying to do this. We're doing it via Zoom recording through my audio desk. And Frederick is also doing an Instagram live. So I'm going to be looking at two sort of cameras at the same time, which is quite strange. Yes, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. <laughs> right, a bit about Frederick and why it's important that we speak with Frederick. Firstly, is that I came across this wonderful flute player on Instagram. And not only is he a beautiful, beautiful player, but he has a wonderful passion for teaching. He is the flutist of the Azahar Ensemble, which is a wind quintet and a member of the Verbier Festival Chamber Orchestra. The big thing, not only, as I've already said, is he a beautiful flute player, but he has a great passion for teaching. And this comes over in his social media. The fact that he is very passionate about sound, he's very passionate about technique, he's very passionate about the whole process of learning and education. And He's, he's inviting people on to actually have these lessons online, not only online, but also to send stuff through Instagram. And to introduce a bit more about him, what I've done is I've cribbed a bit off the internet. It is what most people do, isn't it? And he says, I love teaching because it's the best way I find to keep learning. Keep learning about the flute, keep learning about music, and keep learning about myself. And that's very important to keep learning about myself. This process of learning is what I think every musician should keep through their musical life because it what keeps a musician motivated and improving constantly. Also, I think that when I teach, I'm using all my abilities in an effort that is what makes everything have a sense for me. Transmitting an information, a message, a passion, an idea, a feeling to another person. When playing with orchestra or chamber music, this feeling is very intense and the message is transmitted through the musical language. But I love the combination that teaching offers between playing and a more intellectual and empathetic work. I mean, how wonderful to be able to script it like that because that encompasses the pure love for teaching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's like, for me, teaching really, it's like... Um... It's it's what you have what you have said before. It's totally the best way I have to keep in in shape and to keep totally on the path. You know, totally because in order to let's say teach, you have to communicate, and if you have to communicate something, you have to think first. What do you want to communicate? And for me, this is this is totally crucial. It's I don't know I don't know. It's I cannot imagine uh, making music without uh, without having to teach because first of all when i'm teaching something it's that i'm having to learn that before for me for myself and then being able to communicate it to the other person and sometimes not sometimes but all like almost all of the times i'm i have to think about a solution or about something that maybe it's not what i will do for myself because for me, that's the important key also about, uh, about, about teaching, let's say. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about the other person. <laughs> because I, I, I don't know how to explain myself. It's very, something very concrete. But it's not only about speaking about your things or your thoughts. It's trying to put everything you know to help another person with some problem that maybe you have never thought before. Or that maybe the solution you have for yourself, it's not the solution that's working for this person. 
I think this is very, very interesting because it makes that you have to wide a lot your knowledge. And I don't know, I'm, I'm learning how to teach. I'm learning how to play all the time. And, be, and I'm, I try to be also very humble. It's like, I don't know a lot of things. Really, I don't know. <laughs> it's like this. It's like this. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm doing videos and I'm doing things because I also want that people tell me things and learning from what they comment on. For, I mean, it's like this. Uh, it's like, I, I don't know. I, I like to have this kind of a little bit, not naive because it's not naive, but a little bit, yeah, innocent way of, okay, I, I know this, I share. And then if you know better, tell me, you know, and, 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 and whatever. I think it's, 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 I think this is very, very interesting. And the social media offers a very interesting tool for that. Not only for, for, for um, let's say, for wasting our time, but we can do something that <laughs> can be very constructive also, no? So I think it's quite interesting. So where did the love of teaching come from? Did you have a really good teacher to start with who then, who you could really feel the depth and warmth of his love for teaching and wanting to expand your musical horizon? Or is it something that you've just want that's inside you? <sighs> It's uh, as everything in life, there is a the explanation. It's very complex. Uh, there is not only one, as you have said before with your question, very brilliantly uh, for ask. There is never one, um, one reason. No, uh, I had wonderful teachers and I know that I was very, very lucky, very lucky. And from then I received, let's say, this passion. For, for teaching and then it's combined with my passion that I have another one is like to speak I mean to communicate more than speaking I really love to communicate things uh, and music is one is one tool that we have to communicate things and speaking is another one so teaching we can combine the two of them <laughs> so we can speak and we can play and, and, and etc and we can speak about playing or playing about what we speak and this i think it's something for me quite interesting this is why i love to do these kind of talks also to have guests to, to have these flute talks and i think it's quite interesting and then about the teachers i have to say as i said before that i was very lucky for instance for me the experience i had with uh, Vicente Prats is a solo flute in the Orchestre de Paris I mean, he's amazing. He's really amazing. And he's this kind of passionate uh, uh, people, like totally exaggerated, passionate, you know? And then what I learned from him is that he really goes deep, you know? He knows who you are, you know? And then he goes he goes to search you, you know? And he, I don't know. Uh, and this kind of thing of being able to read how you are, what do you need? Then you have to practice this at you. Then, you know, he, think, he was thinking, no? Uh, all the time and and from him I learned this and then from Felix Rengli that was my teacher here in Basel I learned this kind of super high standard art, art, artist or musicianship I don't know how to say that it transcends the instrument and the lessons for me were very interesting um, only to hear he, him uh, share um, her, her, his reflections or the thoughts you know and imagine if that it's then applied to your playing so then it's amazing no so I think that from them both, I, I learned really a lot, but not only about flute playing. That's the, the important thing. This is why I have this passion. And somehow I have this need that if I know something, I need to share with people. I don't know how to how, how to say. I, even if it's very stupid thing or very, yeah, whatever. If it's some anecdote about a, a football player of Barcelona, then I need to share that with people. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like this. So then, Before we go into some more detail on your teaching and how you teach, I have to speak about the problems you've been experiencing that you've been putting on Instagram that you've been practicing in your car and in your garage. Now, when we first started seeing you practicing in the car, it was a bit strange. And then you explained the reason why. But also, you've turned that into a positive. Can you just explain to our listeners why you are practicing in your car? Well, it's basically because, uh, okay, uh, we are experiencing, um, we are, we have very bad luck. Um, we have to say that's the first thing because that's only really bad luck. It's like we have uh, some neighbors that they, uh, they are complaining when, when we play. And, and then here in France, because I have said I live technically, well, not technically, it's, I live in France, but it's 800 meters from the Swiss border. But anyway, that's France. And in France, the law, uh, it protects the, let's say, the, the health of the neighbors, something that I really understand. I mean, it's like the law 
protects that the neighbor is not disturbed. So if they hear you, they make they can call the police and they don't. Yeah, and they don't have any. They, there is there is not a need even to make a to miss to measure how many decibels it is. And so no, it's not like this. So if they hear you, even if it's very little, which is the case then that's it, no, they can call the police. And in our case, we already built a studio in the basement. So in the basement of our place, we built a studio, a little studio, that's where I was recording all my videos and all this, no? And uh, the thing is that the door of this studio is not well professionally isolated, like with a conservatoire door, you know? So then not the viola, my wife is a viola player, um, not the viola, but because it's not, but the flute with the high frequencies, it's a little bit more hair. But really, then an expert came to see the situation, and it's like, I think it's 15 decibels maybe, what you can hear from the entrance of the, of the building. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's not something very loud. But it's not the problem of being loud, it's a problem of being high frequency. That's a flute, you know? So then, the thing is that um, they, uh, it arrives to the point that they, yeah, they were not simply tolerant. And in another situation, it would have been more easy. Like maybe you put some schedule or yeah, that's it. Until we solve it, that, because we are going to do it. We are going to put a door. We are going to isolate that. And then that problem is finished because for these kind of problems, you can always find a solution. But sometimes with people, let's say that maybe sometimes they don't want to find solutions. <laughs> maybe that's, yeah, that's it. That's it. And also the situation was a little bit disgusting, not only because of the playing, because they were complaining about a lot of the stuff. Like even if, if our daughter was crying, you know, and it's like, yeah. what, what can I do if my daughter cries? You know, it's like this. So then in the end, what happens is that if I want to practice, then I have no other chance until we can uh, like isolate because we have, I mean, it, it it's not immediate. We have to, order the door they have to come to install it and so on so until it's solved then it will take some months um so i cannot play at home because basically they did not want to provide a schedule and also so so then i cannot play because i don't know if they are at home or not and if i play they can call the police and i risk that if i play the police comes as they as it happened and i have to stop playing of course it's not illegal i mean it's not but if i keep doing that i could have problems in the future maybe even legally if i keep doing you know so then i don't want to have any any further problems so i stop playing so i went to the garage inside the car because that's the place where they don't hear me it's impossible <laughs> you can't hear nothing nothing so that's it that's the solution i found and um, I'm someone who is like always or tries to because life is life and you cannot force things to be always like, let's say, happy because life is not like this. But I'm someone who tries to be very positive And this is what you say. So I try to look, let's say, the good part of having to practice in the car. And actually, it's like practicing in some place that which is so, so dry acoustically brings us the, let's say, not the possibility because it's a possibility, but we should then think about other things. So how to create more resonance or how to listen ourselves a little bit more here and not, how to say, not being afraid of that we have dirty things here because I don't know, it's somehow interesting too because in the car, it's everything super audible. <laughs> it's like so, this. So when you first sat in the car and started playing or started, um, I, would, I, I take it that your first thing you did was long notes just to get the feel of the resonance. How did that make, yes. how did that make you feel? Did that make you feel sort of lost without, because the sound was so enclosed or did you just spend a little time finding the resonant, resonant areas of your throat on, and within the, the uh, instrument itself? Very, very interesting question, really. It's, you know, uh, uh, this is something I'm, totally, I'm trying to speak always about this kind of feeling because I think it's very personal and everyone can have their own experiences. For me, what happens is that I try to find the mistakes. So then if, if, if it's sounding wrong, then I know where it's wrong. And then I try to feel secure that I know that where is the, the insecure part, you know what I mean? So then I don't know what I did is simply trying to, okay, where it is? It's here. No, no, it's not. So once I knew where it is, you know, where it starts to, to speak the instrument, then I can feel secure that I know that I can play more. 
And then what I, the feeling I have, and I learned much more playing in the car, is that I can leave it found. That I can trust that the, the point is already there. I, I don't have to think so much about that. So just I leave, as you say, I sing, I open the throat, I just play more relaxed, but with knowing that it's not going to crack. You know, uh, the, the, the minimum point, the border, I know where it is. So then I'm, I'm not going to play like this. So just is like for the... So then I just, um, I don't know how to explain. I can just rely, I can... I have a very, a very concrete feeling, which is like swallowing the sound somehow. Like I leave it sound. I'm not going to search it. Because otherwise, when, when what I do sometimes when I'm not feeling secure or when we want, is like we go to search the sound and it's like. Yeah. This is for me a very interesting feeling, like not going to search it, but letting it sound. And of course, the sound is the most important part of a, of a, of a flute player because it is the voice. It is the our voice. It is the voice of the composer. Yeah, technique is really important, especially when you're playing orchestral music and when you're playing as a soloist. But it's that sound that differentiates us. We can all play. Yeah. Many of us can play fast, but it's the sound. And it's the sound that initially drew me to you because when I first saw you on Instagram I just thought wow that sound and the sound is important to you isn't it and the concept and construction of a flute sound you are touching the most the most important topic <laughs> totally it's very 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 interesting topic yes I mean for me the sound is the voice it's the voice of, 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 of a player but it's more than a voice it's for me, the sound is the material that the music is done. It's it's basically this. It's it's crucial, and I, I don't know how to say. It. It's like it's crucial, but on the same time, I think it should be free. That's what I was speaking before. So it's not. I'm not. It's very it's very complicated topic because uh, because yes. it's not it's not when I'm when I play, for instance, I try not to not to find. I try not to have an expectation of I want to have this sound, only this, and if it's not this then it, it's, 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 a fa it's a fail, it's a mistake. Because life is not like this, it's like with life. I mean, you cannot expect tomorrow I'm going to do this and then I'm going to drink this beer at this time of the day. It's not possible <laughs> because maybe you arrive late and then you drink that beer, but it's not so cold and it will... And then that doesn't mean that the beer is going... You are not going to enjoy that. Because the concept is that you are going to enjoy this beer that you like, let's say, in a reasonable circumstances so with the sound i have a concept a little bit like this it's like i'm thinking more about kind of type of sounds uh, or let's say my main voice is like somehow i i always love, love to say is like the sound is like the voice yes but what does it mean it for me is that my voice is my voice unless i have a problem my voice is my voice some days it's a little bit more low because maybe i slept uh, not so much, or other days it's a little bit more like this because I'm tired, but it's my voice. So it's a little bit this concept for me, and I ha we have to love our voice because it's our ways that we we have to express ourselves. And then we should cultivate it so that we can like imitate. I'm not going to do now like uh, stupid things like oh, like this and voices, but it's like what we should with, with, with we should do with the flute is a little bit this. We should be like this kind of. Mm, mm, people that they can imitate also colors and different voices like this, no, and these kind of things. So it's it's this what we should do with the sound. And I don't know, it's very complicated because we should be very flexible, but we should always keep it natural. So because if you have to speak like now, I'm going to speak like this, it's, it's just, you cannot do it because it's not natural. But you have to have the ability of changing uh, for the other color. So it's a, it's a little bit this. Of course, it's a topic we can speak for really ages and, and so on. But I think that everyone has a point. Everyone has a point where it's comfortable. And this is the first thing I'm searching always when I'm, when I'm starting to play. If I need to feel comfortable. I need to find... And I know I have, I have a very clear image of what is the, the, my voice. Even when I hear myself. And then if there is a problem, then I can... I can worry because maybe I have some problem today. I drink something very cold or some whatever. And yeah. and what the only the last thing I can say about this, I think this is very related first with the natural feeling that we have playing, which is even almost physical. I play there, no, and then it sounds relaxed first, 
and which and this is technique because for me this is really technique totally now i was playing this last week with a wooden head joint and it changes slightly mm. but it's super interesting because then i have to adapt the technique to achieve the sound i want and then the other thing it's the more artistical part of it which is for me it's trying to really really listen listen a lot of music i think it's very very important to have the ability of hear a lot but and i think this is this is crucial i mean we should hear a lot of music and you know all, all the the intonations are, it's very important this because then we have these tools and what is difficult then is that when we can, when we can hear so much try not to hear so much when we play because otherwise we go crazy so do you do vocal exercises before you play because as you said it's sometimes you can wake up and your voice is very low and sometimes it's very high yes. how do you find that midpoint with your vo- voice and your vocal cords before you start playing yes i mean f- first of all i have to say that if uh, <laughs> before playing i have spoken normally so <laughs> i mean it's something that before playing the flute i have spoken maybe with my wife or with someone during the day so i know if i have a normal day or not let's say <laughs> if, 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 no it's like this but i'm not joking i mean now being like a little bit more um informal it happened when i was younger uh, this kind of festival orchestras a yacht orchestras we went ah it's a secret sorry for everyone we went to have parties it's normal you know yeah. and then it happened that the next morning you are not in your best condition you know but these I can feel immediately. I mean, we can, we all know, no? Then next morning when I was 22 or something, no? Then you wake up and it's like, oh, hello, good morning, no? And then you know that, you know that this, that you are not in your best condition, in your best shape, no? So then this day I really need to warm up <laughs> with circular breathing. And if I can do this, it's okay. Do you, you know what I mean? On the circular breathing part, do you think it's important or do you think it's it's a good way of actually uh, showing a support mechanism? Because if you can circular breathe on one note without dipping it, dipping the note as you breathe back in, do you think that's really good for support to learn it or do you just think it's um, just something you can do? For me, circular breathing is not something that it's needed. I have to be honest. I mean, you can play perfectly and not being able to do it, and it's okay. I mean, <laughs> because in the music, we need to breathe. So it's not because of that. It's not that we need to do. For me, it's very interesting because, as I have showed now, I was warming up. I mean, today I did not play before. And I'm doing this. when I, If I have to play this, this, this kind of precision things, if I'm doing this drill, with the tool is very easy. And because we have more resistance. So we had not to create that with the with the embouchure or, or with the air. I think it's a very interesting tool, the circular breathing, because we need to be able to make it sound only with the with the um, with the embouchure. You know, so we we need to do with only with the with the blowing uh, with the air that we have already in the mouth. So if we need to do this, and this Felix Rengli told me always, and I agree with him completely, you learn different colors, you learn different approaches of the sound. So I think it's very interesting at least to try or at least to make the flute sound like this. Then if you cannot do it perfectly, it's not my case. I cannot do it super perfectly uh, in all the registers. I am trying, I'm still learning this. But for me, the important thing is this, um, the precision of the sound, not the musical part of it. But it's very interesting to warm up. I warm up doing this. If I can do circular breathing, I can play delicate. It's like this. If I cannot do, then I worry. I have to warm up more. <laughs> It's like this. It's for me. It's like I know immediately. So, with the flute sound, do you think in colours or do you hear the different sounds and depths? How do you how do you measure your sound? And um, as a as a flute player, obviously in an orchestra, it's different because you are being part of a team, a part of a group, and you're gelling the sound mm. together. But yeah. how how do you see a sound? Very interesting question. To me. <laughs> really cool. Well, I think that here it's everyone it's very personal. I, I, I really I can understand that people can get metaphorical here because since the sound it also can be something abstract, then we can get like speaking about even yeah, colors, as we say, yeah, or other kind of metaphors. I, I mean, for me, I have to be honest. For me, it's more related with the way we naturally sing, let's say, and with these variations on the voice, let's say, than with colors or these kind of things with brilliant or dark, I tell you by experience also that sometimes it's complicated because there are people that they understand 
um, like dark for brilliant and they make they mix it up i mean yeah. well it's not that they mix it up they understand it differently uh, and it's very curious for me to see that there were some people that what i understand for bright they see it dark and it's like oh okay well whatever but we understand that this this kind of sound no yes so okay so then the, this is why for me uh, i relate it with the with these modulations on the voice so and this is what honestly I try to do. So I'm not trying to do something very intellectual. Let's say like, okay, now I'm going to, I don't know if I have to play. And I want to play. It has also to be a lot with the vowel, but I'm not, think, I'm not thinking super intellectual again. I'm not, no, no, I'm going to do like, no more. Yes, it depends on what, color um, again or what kind of sound i want to do if it's more or more or more or more or this kind of modulations in the voice is what i think and then i try to anticipate them or i try to practice them so it comes it do... comes down to vowel sounds doesn't it the vowel yes yes for me it's much more easy to think about how i will do with the voice maybe because i sang in a choir for all my childhood and and i sang a lot and uh, then i can somehow sing and then then i know it's not the same than so i just try to reproduce that on the flute no so it's not the same yeah i mean for me listening to a flute player you're listening to a voice you're listening to a conversation and the conversation is what the artist is having with the audience or the listener. And I, for me, it's much easier to understand if, uh, if somebody tells me, if I'm playing and they're saying you need to make it warmer, it's easier for me, okay, I'm older, to understand that I need to change the vowel sound, the sound in my throat, just to either open it out or to deepen whatever it is I'm trying to communicate. But you touched on something really important, which was the embouchure. Now, that is a nightmare, isn't it, to speak about? I don't know. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose it depends. It depends. Yeah. It depends. It depends which country you come from. Well, let's speak about that, yeah. <laughs> I totally get your point. About what you were saying before, then we speak about the embouchure. About what you were saying before, I really have to say, as a musician, I really think the same uh, that you were saying. And I add something else. It's like... For instance, this last week, uh, it happened that we were playing here in the orchestra in Basel, with the Neues Orchestra Basel. We were playing the Symphony Number no. 40 of Mozart. Yeah. And I was very happy because the conductor, that we have a very great relationship with him, but the conductor is starting all the time, and, uh, what to say, to give more singing examples, because it's more easy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes you explain very, let's say, very intellectual things which are super nice and I adore I, I, I'm really I really like these kind of things but sometimes it's easier to say I want than no we start less then we go more and then even you know what I mean yeah it's, it's for me it's more easy to do this. it's clear I mean I think that I think I did, I did something personal for me if the conductor asks the musicians to do this I think that we all have understood and then they're partying, it's partying. It's not tira, it's partying, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and about the embouchure, let's speak about this. <laughs> yeah, because your embouchure is very relaxed. And mm -hmm. when you, um, and you play at a good angle, you play at an angle of yeah. probably uh, 45 degrees. But when you play, all the work, all the work seems to be done in your jaw. Mm -hmm. So you're moving your jaw forward and, and the, your lips are staying very, very stable. And, mm -hmm. and for me, sometimes when I'm watching you play, certainly in the orchestra, when you're, you're um, videoing yourself within the orchestra, it's really interesting to see all the work being done down here. Yeah. Yeah, look, again, this is something so personal. In fact, <clears throat> it's so, I mean, and I, it's not a problem that it's personal. I, it's, I'm totally interested in that. It's the, the most difficult part, I think, about teaching precisely because precisely it's because it's very personal. So, you know, I will always remember because there have been teachers that they wanted to change my emotion. You know, there were teachers that they wanted to change because they were like, maybe it's because I'm playing here. You no, know? like some teachers, they wanted me to play like here, like this, and it's not working. I, I don't know how to play. It's like I cannot, you know. And this is something I don't know. Um, it happened naturally like this since I was a kid. Maybe it's because of the form of the teeth. 
in the teeth, it can be that maybe I place it here and then it's like uh, flat for me in the teeth. Uh, it can be. Mm. Also, I have to say that um, during the time it changed because it's, it, before it was more exaggerated. Even, I was doing even more like this. And during the time I'm playing even more relaxed, more. And I have very close friends, brilliant flute players, that they change the embouchure without wanting. It just. Yeah. Mm, and I told I tell them, look, it can happen because the teeth move and maybe you adapt. Uh, but why it changes? It's because your ears are 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 are, are teaching you, not your, not the mirror. Yeah. This is what I what I feel. It's like I'm not I'm not going to uh, I'm going to to check the mirror. Yes, I do. Like I think we all do. But just to see what happens for curiosity. But I'm always trying to learn from what it sounds. And for, about this topic. Uh, Vicente Pratt, my former teacher in The Bachelor, he told, okay, when he saw me, he was like, okay, it's not sounding bad. <laughs> so he was like, okay, can you play a pianissimo? And, and then he was like, then he was, okay, if you can do this, then the, you have no problem with the emotion. <laughs> this kind of gesture is important. Of course, there are a lot of micro movements involved. It's very difficult to explain because of course, it's toe, toe. I go to set a little bit more forward in the upper registers, a little bit more forward, but then also I cover a little bit more. It's very difficult to, to see. It's like the jaw goes a little bit like this and then like this. Yes. In, it's super micro movement. I'm not doing a lot of things with the, with the jaw, like the traverso players that they have to yes. <laughs> for the intonation. But um, I don't know. Again, what I would say is that I would not. I would never say to a student, "Don't do this." I will always just watch how it sounds because I have students that they play everything super straight. They don't need to move just much more little than me, and it sounds amazing. So then, why should they change? And there are others that they have to move much more because it's not enough. Because otherwise, they are not focusing well. Their, let's say their upper register, so they have to do exaggeratedly more because maybe their lips is different. They have more bigger lips or whatever. I don't know. This is something very that it has to see more with the personal contact point feeling of everyone. And for this, I would recommend really to practice harmonics, really, but yeah. a lot. Yes. A lot. Absolutely, because harmonics, it's, it's really impossible to do the full gamut of harmonics unless you're very relaxed, unless you have the support <laughs> network and you can find that sweet spot which enables you to go up. That's it. And the, for the harmonics, I would recommend to everyone to, to do it in two ways, because normally we do it like, okay, harmonic and we blow and blah, blah, blah. This is very good to open the sound. This is, I, do, do it, I do this a lot for opening the sound to like, eh, and it's different because the contact point is like different. In the, in the bigger one, I go more down. In the other one, I go more like this. Uh, I so, see. Yeah. yeah. And do you, um, do you practice whip whistle tones as well? Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I practice with whistle tones. I did some video about that. I have to do more about this. But I, I, I did one video about the whistle tones. I'm not a specialist. I, I, I have to admit it. I'm not. I, there is people that they are amazing. They can get the whistle tones they want exactly, precisely. I'm not. I'm not able to do. I, I, I have to practice more of this. Actually, I want. <laughs> but I use it. I use it in order to know what not to do. Yes. And and also to know what not to do and to know how to play relaxed, but not having the whistle tone. Because this is something I, I, I spoke with Alberto uh, the, the Acuna, very, a brilliant young flute player from Spain too. He's doing the academy in the Karajan, in the Berlin Philharmonica. And he was saying, yeah, I like when, even if in a low note, it sounds the, it sounds the, the, the whistle tone. For me, it's not bad, he said, because this means that it's relaxed. And he's like, yeah, I completely agree with you. If you, if you have this, but then, you can have the position if you can do it and it sounds like the, the, the whistle down, then you can see, okay, it's not there. It's not. So then if you know that it's not there, you can have the relaxed feeling without the, the whistle down. So this is why I isolate that. No? So if you go. The same relax, but. So I'm not blowing there. I'm blowing. That's that's for, that's very useful for me there because it's like the same relaxed feeling when when you play because you can't play with tension otherwise it doesn't sound the move the the the, uh, the whistle down. Uh, 
النت النت ده Yeah, that that is always my, always my downfall. There's always a whistle tone appears if I'm playing really, really gently. And uh, but I, I get your point. If you can find if a whistle tone appears, you can you should be able to quickly eliminate that by just changing the focus. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one exercise I I I, I ask my students to do sometimes with this and to have a very nice and focused in real but a relaxed, let's say, uh, focus in the low register is to do. To go from the normal sound to the to the whistle one, so so then it's like okay, now don't go to the to the whistle the one. So now whistle. But if you can do the, the both, the go to the normal to the because that's sometimes what we fear. So for me, it's much easier easier to learn from the mistakes always. So it's, I'm doing always these kind of things, like for instance, for the high register precision. What we want uh, normally, we, we don't want that it sounds. This, no. So then, better knowing precisely where is the point that. And then we are not scared because we know where is the mistake, the mistake, the other sound, you know. So when you when you know the sound that you like, you know the sound that you want to play as a flute player. You know, and that that's dependent on the narrative, the story you're trying to get over to the audience, yeah. because the sound will change according to this story. Because one word, yeah. um, I could say one word, you could say another word, but the way we say it will mean very different things. But when yes. you're in, a, in an orchestra, your sound will have to change according to. The group of musicians you're playing with and the style of music, won't you? Who dictates that? Does it? This is it the section or is it the conductor? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends, <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, but this is the, the for me the very funny part of playing uh, with chamber music or in the orchestra. That you you have to sometimes you have to sacrifice sound. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it's not bad. It's it's it, because it's for it's for serving um, the music better. I don't know how to say. It. It's quite clear. This is this is related with what I was saying before about being very well trained with the ears, because then you immediately hear things and you know what happens. I don't know. Yesterday, for instance, um, I was playing this Mozart symphony yesterday, y just yesterday. And I had to play uh, this uh, intervention, very little intervention in the second movement. This, but I had to play with the bassoon. So then I knew that for him it was hard not to be. Um, she was a little bit sharp, but it's normal. Also, as a fifth of the chord, it's not the worst part in the world if it's a little bit sharp. But then I couldn't play. I couldn't play because otherwise it was not matching. But this is something you you in the first rehearsal you see. Okay, in in this in this place. I'm hearing the sound of the bassoon. He's playing, um, let's say, the, the lower octave. So I cannot do what I want. I have to play as he's playing. If it's very uncomfortable, then we will speak. But if I can do, why not? And then with the section, it happens a lot of times. You have to see um, how the oboe player, a lot of times, it's, it's playing. And then you have to, you need to be fast and imitate. Uh, it will be nice that we play like this, because plays the clarinet player. And this sound works much better than playing these kind of things I, I don't know it's very difficult to explain i can't put concrete examples but uh, again it, you have to react because maybe the client player plays more focused so then maybe it works that you play more focused <laughs> you don't know but who moves who moves first so you obviously the relationship in a section is critical which is why when they choose a new player to come in the player has to gel uh, with sound but also the relationship with each other who gives way if you're playing with, say, the oboe or you're playing with a clarinet on a solo? Who leads who? Does, For that, me, does that depend on who has the lead line? or No. For me, it is the lower voice, always. Right. Because let's, let's, be, let's be honest. It's the lower voice, which is the base of the harmonics, and you have to adapt it. Otherwise, you are going to play it out of tune. That's it. It's, like, it's so simple like this. You have to adapt the lower voice, and in all the terms, in the in the that's why the flute player should be the most flexible guy in the in the in the in the in the, in the section. This is why flexibility in the sound for me is the most important thing I learned from the quintet or from the 
or from the orchestra playing. It's you have to change. You you have to really change. You have your voice. You have your sound. You have to do this because otherwise it's not going to work. You have you have it's like you have to hear and then again if it's very uncomfortable for you uh, then you go to you go to you speak with them. Hey, maybe this note you can play more open or maybe we can try this a little bit more low or whatever. But I think that even musically you should. I think the flute player has to adapt with the lower voices. It's like I don't know. Of course, it's very it's very complicated because then because then you are in the front row and musically it's true that we lead somehow. We have this kind of violin role somehow in the winds. In the quintet, it's also a little bit like this. But it's very difficult because it's the compromise between being a violin with the attitude, but playing into the group as it would be like in a like I don't know how to say. We have to play in the orchestra. This is for me very clear. Like when we sing in a choir, wow. you you cannot sing in a choir like, -de 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 -no -no -no. like this is like what are you doing? It's like no, it's not possible. But if you sing the soprano voice in a choir, of course you have to sing musical, but you cannot go like -de -de -no -no, like this. It's not possible. You have to adapt the, the to, to what you hear, and you have to be very expressive and lead musically, but with this kind of choir playing or singing. Um, Mm, approach and of course it changes because then suddenly you have a solo then you can play like soprano like prima donna but then suddenly you change to you no know, to again poem more choral uh, and this is this is why it's complicated this is why sometimes it, it sounds out of tune and it sounds not well balanced it's like it's because of this i have to be honest it's because in some in a lot of orchestras it happens that there are a battle of egos egos yeah and I think that the best thing to play well, everyone, is that everyone should be super flexible. And if there is a problem, you simply speak, and then you have a coffee or a beer or a tea or what you want. But it's but not with a pressure thing. Ah, oh, you are low. You are sharp. You are no, no. Okay, because it's not to for me to play in tune is to play out of tune together. That's to play in, in tune. <laughs> it's 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 like this, because it's I cannot play all the notes in the green of the of the machine. It's not possible. Yeah. Some of the notes are going to be a little bit lower or a little bit sharper, and I'm trying hard really to, to be stable, but it's not possible. It, that's, that's science fiction. We are human first, and the instrument is a tube. So what we should be is flexible. And if a chord is a little bit sharper in the fundamental, then we should go sharp. If the guy in the second bassoon cannot go lower, we can kindly ask him. But if he says, look, guys, I cannot, in this note, I arrive without playing in 20 minutes or 50 minutes and the read is dry, I can do nothing. It will be a little bit sharp. Then we all play sharp. And if I have, of course, it's not super obvious, of course, no? But it's like this. And then this is why we have these fingerings, like uh, B, B, no, B flat. You can play piano and it's more sharp or C. You know, for this kind of extreme things, or even sometimes I play with glissando. Sometimes because it, you, I have to do sometimes because otherwise, I, I I really think that way. It's not possible that I turn to the others and I say, no, you know, I'm I'm right. What does it mean to be right? It's you're right, but you are out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like this. It is, and. It comes back to the main point of the whole of this podcast, which is the beauty of sound, which is the beauty of voice. Um, when you hear some people speaking really, really fast, sometimes it's hard to understand. But we can all speak when we we can all speak fast if we need to speak fast. With the, yeah. with the flute as a as an instrument, as you say, it has an ego. It wants to be a violin. It wants to be a star, and. With training, we can all quite easily learn to play the flute quickly. The hardest part mm -hmm. is con conveying the voice to make the ability to make somebody cry when you... I mean, it's really yeah. hard to make somebody emotional when you're playing fast. You can go, wow, or that's brilliant. Yeah. But to get that emotion, to get the hairs on the back of your neck to stand up, yeah. that is down to that pure tonality, the voice. The flexibility, as you say, but most importantly, the ability to listen and to listen to yourself <laughs> and to listen to others and also to listen to the audience because they're conveying back to you by their eyes and how they're communicating totally. with you. Totally. 
totally in fact this thing with the audience i feel totally it's very important for me and not only because the or the audience of course that the main goal of playing or audience even when they write now comments now unfortunately because we cannot see them uh, physically it would be nice that we could but anyway uh, this kind of feedback it's a that's why we are musicians. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have no sense. I mean, because if I play my card, okay, it's nice or it's funny, but or whatever, or it can be interesting for some students to know some tools or whatever. But that's not the goal that I have uh, being a musician. No, the musician. What I want to see is the reaction of the people, even if it's virtual. Okay, but I want to see the reaction of the people. No, and in a concert, that's something that you cannot pay. No, uh, it's it's this what why you, what, what you're a musician. But I think that this has more to see with living and being a sensitive person and and, a, and an artist more than playing the flute because then you can translate everything this all these things into the flute. In fact, this is a little bit, and I'm speaking all the time more with more colleagues, colleagues and musicians. A little bit the problem with this auditions like uh, sometimes that they are done like with blind auditions or like this is that it's very strange because you cannot feel this feedback and i will always remember the audition i did for the london philharmonic that i was invited to do the trial and i was very happy when i was very young and it was because i could see them i could see the the, the flute panel you know and it was so easy i mean it was like okay hello good morning i play Okay, do this. What, what, what did you study? You have this communication, and I, I really love that because it's how to, how to say it's like you what what you do creates a reaction that you are seeing that even from the the very first note you see if if they like or not, if, you know. And with the audience um, in the concert, I, when I can, I love to speak also, and this is precisely what happens with the with this kind of auditions where you don't see the other the other person. That of course it's a battle against yourself. And it's very complicated. This is very, it's very difficult. But anyway, I think that music, again, as as we started, it's a, it's about communication, and I think we should never forget that um, for all the formats. If it's about speaking, if it's about playing in a concert online, or if it's an audition, it should be always about communication. And if it's not like that, it's we are missing something about the music uh, itself. And of course, communication. You are not going to achieve that playing in your studio alone, um, doing all the technique, staccato, and these kind of things. Because that, it's just the, the way you have to express something. If you don't have that, then you're empty. And this I always tell to, to my students. And what comes out loud and clear in this podcast and in speaking to you, Frederick, is the each note, each lump of, each blob with a stick on the page has a personality. And that personality yeah. isn't a number. It isn't a length of how long you hold it. Each one has a sound that is as valuable as to the next sound. And when you put them together, yeah. they don't become one zero one zero. It's not a computer algorithm. What it does, it creates that emotion. And that emotion, which gives yeah. you your voice, which gives you your performance, your music, and enables you to convey what it is you want to convey to the audience and makes you different. And that's what makes you different on Instagram, sir, because you, as you say, you can't not tell people when you, when you find something sitting in your car, which you find a sound, you find a way of practicing, you have to tell us about it. And yes, it was, it was quite amusing to start with, but actually we're all learning something now. You're sitting in your car and saying, hey guys, I'm sort of, I've, I've thought about this and I'm doing this. And have you, have you thought about doing it? And it got, it got to the point where I actually went into a cupboard to see whether I could get the same sound, the same reaction in a cupboard be, that you got in your car. So uh, yes. it's, it's, the whole thing is about sound. And with you, yes, you're technically gifted as well, but you just have a sound that um, is, has been developed through listening, through being very flexible and understanding and always being a student of the sound, never thinking I have the right sound. You are a student of the sound and you will always be it. You're a life learner. And you know, I would, I would love after, we've this been going on for an hour, Frederick. And I think for our listeners, all I would say to them is anybody can play fast. If you, as Frederick say, if you want to stay at home and practice all the studies, all the technique studies, but it won't make you very different. 
and that you can only listen to someone playing fast for so long. But when you're playing beautiful music, that is the music that, when you listen to a film, when you listen to an orchestral concert, it is that slow beauty that makes something happen, that makes the magic happen. And as we've listened to today, it's all about flexibility, listening, and being aware of the various functions of making the tone on the flute. I totally agree. And I, I understand that sometimes the, I am the first one that sometimes I also, it's possible to have the, to do a show of, of technique. It's, it's great. This kind of virtuoso, Paganini. I mean, it's, it's nice. I mean, I, I really, I, it, it's, it's funny, let's say, or it's, but even, even that, even that, it's always has, has this flexibility be, behind. I mean, it, you can play, the, for me, the best example is the Chopin piano concertos. If you if you hear the Chopin piano concertos, it's amazingly virtuoso, but it's so beautiful. Yes. It's so expressive. And all the notes are not important. It's just a flower which is yeah. there and lands into a very beautiful chord. So this is what we should. And for this, the only thing I can say is like I agree with you totally, John Paul, totally. And I really think that we should. Mm, we are artists. We should be sensitive. That's it. It's our sensitivity and we want, what we want to express. It's the most important thing. And then, having said that, it's like it's difficult because there is there can be also the tendency. There can be also the tendency, let's say, to say no, no, don't worry. Just let's be, uh, let's express, let's you know what, uh, let's uh, I don't know, let's go beyond that. And, but the difficult part is that. In order to do this, you have to be very stable, flexible, yes, uh, very stable technically. So it's very difficult because, unfortunately, playing an instrument is not easy. So you have to be gifted technically. You have to have practice a lot, a lot, but a lot of hours. And then when you have this, you can go to the other part and you can put all of this in the service of your sensitivity. But it's difficult. You cannot... You cannot you cannot do this without this base basement. That's the that's the difficult part of it. That that's that's what's difficult or sometimes frustrating. And what I can say is that go for that, go to practice, but never forget that it, this is for the other thing. I don't know. I, I I only put an example and we finish. It's like now this in this pandemic year and so on. I started to do sport like to run. No, it's not important for for people. It's okay. I know, but. The important is why are you running? Are you running because you have no goal, or, or I, I wanted to run because I wanted to feel in shape, and it was for me, you know. So there is a reason why you are doing this, because otherwise, imagine that you go to run because I don't know, like a like a robot, like you are not going to do this. You are not. You, you are going to do this one day. Second day, you are bored. So it's the same with practicing. It should be something more there, and it should not be something empty. If it's empty, it's not going to work. It, you, should have, you should have something which is deep, which is a need of communicate, which is a need of expressing yourself. And then, then it's worth it. <laughs> then it's worth to practice and to have all the tools to express that. As human beings, we all want a need to express ourselves. And we all mm. need to understand that we are unique as well. And as Frederick yeah. earlier in the, uh, this podcast said is, he said, we're all unique and no one person, no two people have the same sounds. No two people have the same richness or we all have different levels within set the, the parameters of each note. And it's understanding that and it's understanding our own, who we are ourselves as human beings and as musicians and to accept that and then just to flower. And once we begin to flower, then as musicians, we can tell the story and look at the audience in the eyes and we can see the emotion and then really there is no right and there is no wrong because ultimately it's the audience you're doing this for the audience you're doing this for the listener totally totally and i really think it's 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 for me at least it's very linked and i think that it is transmitted this is why i share with you on openly it has a lot to see that you love your voice you should love your voice you should love yourself you should think that 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 it's working. You know what I mean? It's very important. It's like if you if it's imagine that an actor doesn't love his voice or her voice. <laughs> it would be stupid, no? I mean they, they somehow they believe that the role they are doing. So we should do the same. 
And then if you are not happy with the, with the, your voice, you can practice as the actors also do. But this. You've just come up with the name of the podcast. You have to love your voice. Yes, <laughs> that's it. So that's great, John Paul. Thanks a oh, lot for the invitation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, you, I, I learn a lot. And I, I thank you for all the videos that you do because they're honest videos and we can all learn a lot from that. And you have, you've invited people to send videos to you for, for, for mm. teaching and for critiques. Can you tell us about that? Yes, of course. In fact, there was one comment uh, about that. Pietro Mattiel, he said, I already sent the video you asked for, but I didn't respond. Sorry, because I was playing with the orchestra this week and I had no time. But yes, I, I, I encourage everyone. I'm launching, let's say, a new, um, yeah, not a, not, not a new project, but a new idea that I, what I want to do is that people, it will be like a hashtag on Instagram, which is like a flute questions. And then and anyone can place their questions, but it's not for students to get lessons only. You know, it's not this because it's not a lesson. It's, it's just even for professionals, for everyone, eh, amateurs, so that if they have a question, but not a question that they want, and I'm saying like, a question they have with themselves or even if they want to share with something hey i learned this look you no know, for instance a friend did that uh, she's a brilliant spanish flute, flute teacher he did that and it's very interesting so then what i do <clears throat> is that they um you can record a video one minute video it should be short because then instagram otherwise it's like it's better if it's one minute very concrete and then the person records that or does a question or whatever but better playing and then I have this video and I do another video response uh, in order to that. And sometimes it can be answering to this or sometimes it can be adding something or an exercise or, or some thought. And I think it can be very, very interesting because then we have it in a hashtag and we have like the post. So someone makes something, I do a video. Sometimes, you know, and then you have like all the videos there. So like we have this community somehow feeling too. So feel free, all of you, if you want to participate, do that. You can record whatever you... It can be the first note in the Mozart flute concerto, you know? <laughs> yes. It can be this. It can be everything. Uh, how to play the last note in Syrinx. It can be this. And you, you try, you play, and then I will do a video sharing my thoughts about that. Yeah. It's simply this. So for those listening on the podcast, you can find Frederick at Frederick Flute, which is F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-F-L-U-T-E on Instagram. Please go and follow him and just sit and watch. He posts a lot of videos, and he, he, as, as I said, you get the raw flute player. You get you get the real flute player. You get the life without filters, without echo reverberation. You get exactly what it is. So thank you, good sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks to you. It was a pleasure to speak with you. It's always a pleasure to, sp to speak with sensitive uh, human beings and sensitive musicians, precisely. So thanks a lot. And thank you for everybody joining us on Instagram Live. It's been great. Yes. So sorry my hands haven't been uh, quick enough to reply to everybody. I'm doing a, a Zoom as well as the uh, <laughs> as, as well as no. Instagram. It's okay. Thanks a lot for being there in the Instagram live too. Uh, Kathy Flute, she says that it was fantastic, that she loved everything uh, about we say about flexibility in the orchestra because it's so true. And that some that sometimes people is not saying that loud. I think we should because, and we should tell these things to the young, younger generations. It's what I try to do also because it's the truth and it, it's music playing in, in a group is this. So... Anyway, for me at least. Eh? <laughs> anyway. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. Ciao, ciao, Jean-Paul. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.